Every day, the mailman delivers to my house <laughs> reminders that I'll be turning 75 in the not too distant future. Repeated reminders to use a different company for my Medicare plan, uh, various uh, appliances uh, you know, that I can use around the house, and of course, make sure I fill out an application for long-term care insurance, don't leave home without it, and on and on. Coupons for hearing aids, walkers, adult diapers. I mean, it's a big business out there. It's a big business out there. So these and other reminders tell me that I belong to a demographic representing the largest group in America, the boomer generation, uh, we've become senior citizens. Uh, uh, the largest group in America are senior citizens, demographically anyways. The wartime babies have retired and formed the single most influential segment of our society. You wouldn't know it by some of the things that are going on, but Again, demographically, this is, this is so. Politicians and marketers are not ignorant of this fact as laws are being passed that speak directly to these voters' concerns and products are being developed that will meet uh, our growing needs. Now, if you want to invest your money, you can't go wrong if you put it into nursing homes and funeral parlors because these are the growth industries of the future. I know, isn't this an encouraging sermon? Someone said, will we be encouraged? Yes, but you'll have to wait. <laughs> For the moment, while the relatively young, healthy seniors are around, Companies selling uh, luxury cars and condos in Florida and travel agencies and home improvement products, they're working hard to sell you their products. They're saying to you, come on, it's, it's time to relax. It's time to enjoy yourself, indulge yourself because you've worked hard and you deserve it. That's what the commercials are, are saying. Of course, what the commercials and the politicians and the salesmen don't say, but secretly imply is this. You'd better enjoy yourself and get yourself a comfortable place to be old in because you're going to die sooner or later. And for some, it's going to be sooner than later, unfortunately. Of course, I'm not against you know, retiring comfortably and doing things that I, I was too busy to do earlier in my life. And I hope to have the time to do that someday. What I'm against is the total disregard for God's presence in one's life, especially when one's life is drawing nearer and nearer to its end. The great danger in America is that rich seniors seek only to maintain their comfort until the end. And the poorer ones grow older, resenting the fact that their American dream was lost in the financial meltdown or the bubbles that blew up in the last several uh, decades. The golden years should be special. And they can be if we are searching for what is truly precious. The Lord is the gold of the golden years. He should be the wealth that we have after a long life. Not more things. I think we should know that by now. I mean, all of our things are simply going to turn to dust like ourselves. So in Psalm 71, an old man describes three golden blessings that only God can provide when we are old. And I'd like to share those with you tonight. Now a little background on the Psalm. 
This psalm was written by an older person who was suffering some kind of illness. We don't know exactly what illness he had. It is a serious and life-threatening illness, however. His problem is that his enemies see this weakness as an opportunity to attack him and try to destroy his character. They're saying that he is sick because he is a sinner. You know, if you weren't a sinner, you wouldn't be sick. Kind of a mindset that existed at that time, much like Job's friends accused Job. They said, you know, the reason you're having all these problems, Job, is because you're a sinner. Well, just confess your sin and everything will be okay. And so in writing this psalm, the old man goes to God in prayer for help and, as I mentioned before, reveals three golden blessings that God has supplied him with in his later years. The first golden blessing is security. Security. Let's read, shall we? In verse one, he says, in you, O Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be ashamed. In your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be to me a rock of habitation to which I may continually come. You have given commandment to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Rescue me, O my God, out of the hand of the wicked, out of the grasp of the wrongdoer and ruthless man. For you are my hope, O Lord God. You are my confidence from my youth. By you I have been sustained from my birth. You are he who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually of you. I have become a marvel to many, for you are my strong refuge. My mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all day long. Do not cast me off in time of old age. Do not forsake me when my strength fails. For my enemies have spoken against me and those who watch for my life have consulted together saying, God has forget, forsaken him. Pursue and seize him for there is no one to deliver. Now note the words that he uses to de describe the safety that he finds in God. He says, God is his refuge, his safe place in verse one. Then he says, God is his rescuer in verse two. God is his dwelling place in verse three. He continues, God is his fortress on a rock, verse three. God is his savior, verse four. God is his hope. Verse five, God is his confidence. Verse five again, God is his sustainer. Verse six, and God is his protector and deliverer. Verse 11, those are a lot of descriptions that describe exactly the same thing. God is his protector, his safety. He's just said it in so many different ways. You see, the world has always offered gold, armies, locks, laws to protect us. And they do to a certain extent. This man has found who can make him feel safe. And that is the Lord. You know, there's a lot of gadgets, you know, that guarantee that they'll protect you but it is the Lord who is able to make you feel safe in his presence. In verses seven to 10, he says that even when it seems that all are against him, that he is in imminent danger, he will trust in the Lord to keep him safe. Security cannot be measured in money or weaponry because people who have a lot of both still don't feel safe. They just feel safer than the people who don't have the, you know, we got a, a bigger army, more tanks. We feel a little safer than you do because you don't have as many tanks and you don't have as many, you know, whatever, air, aircraft carrier uh, as we do. But in order to feel totally secure, 
one must go to the Lord and find safety in Him. And so uh, the golden blessing of the aged is that in their weakness and vulnerability, they can feel safe in God. And that is a blessing indeed. The next blessing he talks about in the Psalm is the blessing of witness, witness. As I said, another golden blessing of the ages, uh, of the aged rather, is a lifelong witness of faith that grows stronger and not weaker with age. Everything else grows weaker in our lives, but our faith is the thing that grows stronger as we grow older. The body dissipates with age, but God blesses the faithful with an ever increasing and powerful witness as they grow older. In verse 12 and 13, he says the following, O God, do not be far from me, O my God, hasten to my help. Let those who are adversaries of my soul be ashamed and consumed. Let them be covered with reproach and dishonor who seek to injure me. And so even though things are going badly for him, he's sick, he's being attacked unjustly, he continues to call upon and trust in the Lord. In verses 14 to 16, he continues, but as for me, I will hope continually and will praise you yet more and more. My mouth shall tell of your righteousness and of your salvation all day long, for I do not know the sum of them. I will come with the mighty deeds of the Lord God. I will make mention of your righteousness and yours alone. And so their attacks and his illness and his old age cannot suppress his faith, cannot suppress his enthusiasm for God. It's as if the inner man of faith grows more visible as the outer man of dying flesh grows weak. And then in verses 17 to 19, he says, O oh God, you have taught me from my youth and I still declare your wondrous deeds. And even when I am old and gray, O oh God, do not forsake me until I declare your strength to this generation, your power to all who are to come. For your righteousness, O God, reaches to the heavens. You who have done great things, O God, who is like you? And so he's praised and he's trusted God all of his life. And as his death becomes imminent, he grows stronger and stronger in his appreciation for the Lord and the Lord's blessings. You know, one common complaint of the elderly is that they, they live in the past or they're dissatisfied with the present and they sometimes refuse to accept the future and the new things that are coming about. This is man's past and man's present that resembles the future. But this man here in the Psalm he spent a lifetime telling of God's great deeds. And now in old age, nothing can stop his praise and witness of God's love and God's power, not even death. Even though he's close to death, that can't stop him from praising God and telling others how marvelous God is. And that is a powerful witness. It's okay if, you know, if you're 40 years old and you can lift 200 pounds over your head and you can run a mile in four minutes and you know, you're, 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 you know what I'm saying? You're in great shape and you, you're praising God. You know, God is great, life is great, you know, everything is great. And, that, and that's a wonderful witness. But when your strength is gone and the vitality that you had as a young man or a young woman, when that's gone, and when you're dealing with illnesses that have the potential of taking your life uh, any day, and you still are able to praise God and glorify Him honestly and sincerely and enthusiastically, that's something. That's a marvelous witness. That's a powerful witness. 
to uh, people uh, around you. And so the third golden blessing mentioned is confidence, confidence, verses 20 to 24. He says, you who have shown me many troubles and distresses will, revi will revive me again and will bring me up again from the depths of the earth. May you increase my greatness and turn to comfort me. I will also praise you with a harp, even your truth, O oh my God. To you I will sing praises with the lair, O Holy One of Israel. My lips will shout for joy when I sing praises to you and my soul, which you have redeemed. My tongue also will utter your righteousness all day long, for they are ashamed, for they are humiliated who seek my hurt. You know, it, it, it takes great confidence to let go of this life. I, I've seen many people struggle to hang on to this life, not wanting to leave this earth. They struggle in death. They fight it and they fight it and they refuse to accept it. And usually that's because this place, this earth is where they belong. This world is, is really home and they love it here and they never want to leave here. The writer says that he looks forward to being with God, to praising Him and, and confessing His name. He's not afraid to die. He looks forward to it because it will release him to finally be with the one that he's always wanted to be with. It'll finally allow him to see the one that he's only seen with the eyes of faith. This feeling of confidence is a blessing bestowed on those who have been faithful to the Lord and obeyed his word and confessed his name. You, you, you can't practice being confident. You, you can't psych yourself out so you'll be confident before death. That's a gift from God. God gives you that gift, confidence before death. You can't psych yourself up for that. There's no book you can read that'll say 10 ways to feel confident you know, before you, no. No, no, that, that's something that God gives uh, to the faithful. Confidence before death is the most precious blessing of all because it confirms a life lived faithfully and it provides the peace and joy that we need at the most critical time of our lives. You ever notice the very bad people, you know, the very, very, very bad people in this world? You know, and, and of course, we always mention Hitler, but he's a good example of being a very, very bad person, right? What do these guys do? When, when, when things are kind of closing in around them and they have the chance, what do they do? Well, they kill themselves, that's what they do. They kill themselves because they've got nothing to look forward to. And they mistakenly think that there's, there's nothing after death. So they figured, well, I've done all the harm I can do in this place. I might as well just shut my life down. What a surprise they are in for. Then the opposite of that, and I have, and perhaps you have too, is holding the hand of a faithful Christian as they slip from this life into the next. There's calmness, there's joy, there's prayer, there's praise. And the thing that I've noticed, there's no fear. And it's very hard to project that feeling, you know, like when you're sitting here, when you're sitting here, you're saying, boy, I sure hope that happens to me. I sure hope you know, I'm not a coward uh, when it comes time for me to die. But the psalmist is telling you, don't worry about that because your faithfulness while you are alive brings you the blessing of having no fear to face death. The old man in the psalm says that those who are his enemies 
will be ashamed of themselves for having attacked him and spoken badly about him when they observe the confidence that he has when he faces death. They're going to see that he was genuinely a faithful a servant of God. So, to summarize, the true blessings of old age don't come from the things that we've produced or the amount that we've saved. The true blessings of old age come from the one we've spent a lifetime knowing. Those who have invested their time and resources in knowing and serving the Lord will find true gold in the golden years. So someone said to me as a preacher, you know, they say, why, why do we have three services? You know, why do we have three services a, a week? You know, isn't it good enough? You know, the Lord commands, you know, we take the communion. Why can't we just come Sunday and you know, take the communion and then just, you know, what, where does it say in the Bible? It doesn't say anywhere in the Bible, three times a week, five times a week. It doesn't say anywhere. What it says in the Bible is that we should know God. <laughs> that we should know God because the reward of life comes from knowing God. Now I ask you a question. When do you have a better chance of knowing God? If you hear the word of God once a week, twice a week, three times a week, how about four times a week? How about every single day as we read our Bibles every single day? Uh, you know, in, in our own privacy. Knowing God, knowing who He is, this is the reward. This is what brings the reward. I, 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 wish, we would, I wish we would know that. And so those who've invested their time and resources in knowing and serving the Lord will find true gold in the golden uh, years. They will feel safe regardless of the condition of their bank account, the condition of the government, or the condition of the world. They will feel safe. They will also be filled with praise in the knowledge that each day reveals more clearly to the world their true spiritual nature and all that that means. And they will have confidence in facing their greatest enemy, which is death. These are things that money or influence cannot buy. Only God can give these golden blessings to those who reach their golden years. Now, the wonderful thing about these golden blessings is that the Lord wants everyone to have them. Whether you are old or young, Ask yourself this evening, do I want these blessings for myself now and in the future? If you don't have these things, perhaps it's because you haven't obeyed the gospel uh, in confessing Christ and expressing your faith in repentance and baptism. Or perhaps you haven't lived like God wants you to live. Only you know that. Or perhaps like many, you've simply become a little too involved in the world and its activities and begun to neglect the Lord. You know, the danger of old age is that it tends to make us focus on ourselves just a little too much. So will you have these blessings when you are old? You know, the sermons should have a question every once in a while. And that's the question that this sermon has. Will you have these blessings as you grow older? Do you have these blessings now in your senior age? I leave you with a true story, true story taken from a book about heaven written by a fellow named Randy Alcorn. And uh, brother John Wright actually lent me uh, that book. And in the book, Alcorn writes the following. He says, perhaps you've come to this book burdened 
discouraged, depressed, or even traumatized. Perhaps your dreams, your marriage, your career or ambitions have crumbled. Perhaps you've become cynical or have lost hope. A biblical understanding of the truth about heaven can change all of that. In 1952, young Florence Chadwick stepped into the waters of the Pacific Ocean off of Catalina Island. She was determined to swim to the shore of mainland California. She'd already been the first woman to swim the English Channel both ways. The weather on that morning was foggy and chilly. She could hardly see the boats accompanying her. Still, she swam for 15 hours. When she begged to be taken out of the water along the way, her mother in a boat alongside told her she was close and that she could make it. But finally, physically and emotionally exhausted, she stopped swimming and was pulled out of the water. It wasn't until she was on the boat that she discovered the shore was less than a half mile away. At a news conference the next day, she said, all I could see was the fog. I think if I could have seen the shore, I would have made it. Consider her words. I think if I could have seen the shore, I would have made it. For believers, that shore is Jesus and being with him in the place that he promised to prepare for us where we will live with him forever. So let's not allow the fog of old age or illness and the sorrows of life obscure the other shore of life that we are uh, yearning for where Jesus is and is uh, waiting uh, for us uh, to be uh, with us. Let's not allow the things that go on in this world, as I say, to fog our vision and uh, you know, not allow us to see the other shore where Jesus uh, waits for us with our reward. If you uh, have a, a need uh, to readjust your faith, readjust your focus. Perhaps it's a, a simple need of prayer to be stronger. Uh, whatever that is, the church meets once, twice, three times a week. The church meets with the purpose of edifying one another and praying for one another. And so if this is a time where you personally need prayer or you need to confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then we encourage you to do that now as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.